We are parents, teachers, and educators. And like you, we're passionate about restoring our culture for Christ. This is Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Hello again, I'm Marlon Detweiler, and you've joined us for another episode of Veritas Vox, the voice of classical Christian education. Today we have with us Dr. Peter Lightheart. Peter, thank you for joining us. Marlon, it's a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for your leadership in the area of uh, education of our young people. Well, it has been uh, a real joy uh, to do that, but I've enjoyed knowing you and, and uh, being involved a bit with things that you do and you with us. Tell us, though, a little bit for our listener, a little bit of your personal background, growing up, family, education, and, and how your career has uh, taken you to Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. Okay, well, the short version of that, I was born uh, 71 years ago in northern Ohio, east of Cleveland, to a uh, Finnish ethnic family that was Christian and uh, kind of a conservative evangelical Baptist background. And uh, so that gave me a lot of uh, parental biblical encouragement. I went to a public high school, went off to Cedarville College. I married my high school sweetheart. We've been married for over 50 years now. Oh, good uh, went off to uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and then came to Philadelphia to do my PhD studies at Westminster. Along the way, I really became more and more committed to reform theology as I discovered the Westminster Confession, Calvin's writings, and I did my doctoral dissertation on Calvin and the Covenant. Uh, we've had uh, two uh, daughters that are grown. We have four grandchildren, and my wife has been a lifelong uh, emergency room nurse, so I've had a lot of medical uh, uh, wisdom surrounding me at all times. And uh, my pastoral work, I began my first pastoral work in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in a, a small country town called Oxford, Pennsylvania. I know Oxford, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've been was there for six years. I always like to say I read theology at Oxford for six years, and people are very impressed till I say. And, and the horse and buggies were very quiet, so they didn't. Yeah, I, 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 that one wouldn't slip past me. I know Oxford better than that. <laughs> <laughs> then I was uh, uh, joined the staff of a PCA church where I served about three years in Newark, Delaware, by the University of Delaware, and then came to Bryn Mawr and helped launch a small little church where I pastored for almost 20 years and then was called in my last couple of years there to Westminster where I've served now for 18 years as the president. I'm a church historian by training, a pastor by experience, and now an administrator that uh, uh, serves one of the world's, uh, I think, finest reformed seminaries. Well, for the time, there was a time period, and I think it was when we first met, that you were serving as the senior pastor of a PCA church in Philadelphia or the suburbs and the president of Westminster Seminary. And I didn't know if you were superhuman or crazy. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not superhuman and I probably am a bit crazy. <laughs> the uh, The reason that that was uh, made sense is because the, the church didn't uh, need me to leave at that moment. And the seminary needed a president very quickly, and I was equidistant between both campuses. So for a period of time, I said, I'll do both because I think it made sense. And there was even a sense where maybe my term as the president would be short to get just help them over the hump and go back to pastoring. But then uh, over time, it became clear they needed a, a president to carry on, and it was time for me to step aside from my past work. So I did it for uh, both for about three years until both were happy that I stopped doing both. So. <laughs> well, I do know that you left the church in very good shape, and, and that's uh, a good sign of a leader. And you, you've talked about uh, leadership in a couple different categories and knowing a little bit about some of your writings. I'd like to focus our conversation on leadership in the church and in government. Let's focus on the church first, if we could. You know, we're uh, involved in, uh, well, our mission, of course, is restoring a uh, culture for Christ, one young heart and mind at a time. And we believe 
that one of the key categories where restoration is needed is in church leadership, uh, that the church, the, the senior pastor and the pastoral position in general is not uh, what it once was. How would you describe what you think, if you agree with that, uh, how would you describe what we have lost in the pastoral role, if not broader, at least in the scope of the 250 almost years of American history? Well, that's a, a, a marvelous question that would take a, a lot of careful <laughs> analysis. But I, I let me begin by a general statement. Uh, in classical uh, thinking, there are three attributes that are essential for a leader. They're the, the words ethos, pathos, and logos. Yep. Ethos is your ethical character. Pathos is your ability to really sense the feelings and emotions of the context. Logos is your ability to be reasonable. If you compromise any of those three, you begin to fail to be an effective leader. When all three of them come together, the impact that a leader makes is substantial. And so what, what do we mean by ethos? Well, that's the ability from a Christian perspective to carry out the ethics of Christ, the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament. And the truth is that no one does them perfectly. We all are sinners. That's the beginning of the gospel. And every leader and every pastor, it doesn't matter where it is, we fall short of the glory of God. We need a Savior. But to the extent that we begin to have a character development of doing what's right, that makes for a re responsible, trustworthy leadership. Character is compromised today. We are everywhere seeing bad role models. Our culture lets people get away with things that are at one time would have been unthinkable. And so that is uh, power corrupts. When too much power gets in one's hands, corruption happens. That's in ministry or in government. So accountability. The idea of logos, we're loosening our standards of academic excellence among our clergy. There was a sense where uh, pastors were expected to know the original languages or have substantial experience. Today, a person, because of celebrity or popularity or just uh, you know, charisma, personally, suddenly are in leadership, and that compromises their ability to lead. Uh, so logos, and then the idea of, of pathos one of the things our perhaps our past leaders might have lost is that often they were very well educated and they were very uh, powerful, but they didn't have sympathy with their people. And so the pastoral skill sometimes was lost with leadership. So I, I go with the Apostle Paul, who's sufficient for these things? Who can have them all? So that I think is what we're struggling with is how do we find the requisite requirements to be a leader in all of those areas. And so part of the solution has been to have uh, more of a, a staff approach, to have people that have different gifts. And I think that is a valuable thing. In other words, no one person can do it all. To be a great preacher doesn't mean you're going to be a great pastor. To be a great pastor doesn't mean you're going to be a great teacher. So sharing our gifts, and ultimately in the Presbyterian context of which I come the plurality of leadership among elders and pastor was part of the solution mm -hmm. that you had more than one person leading collectively, holding each other accountable and also supplementing each other's gifts. So when I put all that together, a, a, a godly leader recognizes that in humility, he needs others to help him to fulfill his job. Nobody can do it all well. So that's a beginning of an answer. I could unpack it more fully, but I think Excellence in character is lost today. Excellence in theological training is being compromised. And pastoral care uh, is something that we're getting better at. But if you only do pastoral care and you don't have teaching and theology, uh, we're going to be weak as well because it's more than just relationships. We need all of those things. Um, the Roman Catholic community in years gone by had such a high regard uh, for uh, the church leader, the priest, that it was kind of the ultimate calling. Martin Luther spoke against that, saying that all callings are valid and good, uh, but there was a sense in which that permeated the community where I think even the Protestant pastors were regarded uh, with 
uh, an element of respect, not because necessarily of their character or their education, uh, but rather their position. That seems to me to be an important aspect that we don't have. Would you agree with that? Well, I think uh, the office of the pastor is something that we need to continue to honor, even though there have been less than ideal pastors in its and I think that's true in government as well, that we are, because of our political rivalries and our assault methods of campaigns today, we no longer respect people in the office. And so what we often need to learn is, can we respect the office even as we critique the occupant of the office? In other words, the people that are there are imperfect, but yet they hold an, a, a noble position, a high calling that's worthy of respect even if they are less than ideal. And so, but on the other side, you can see if you have such a high view of the office, they that when there is real crises in character, as the Catholic Church has found, they, they've, they've so honored the office that a, a whole aspect of child uh, abuse was, yeah. uh, was neglected. Yeah. And yeah. so we do have to have the ability to hold the office with a uh, high regard, but also to hold the occupants accountable for their place within it. So it's a both end. It's not an easy balance, and we need to restore a proper respect for both. Yeah. Well, you're involved in that process as the president of a seminary, whose uh, one of the most significant things that you do is you uh, help people graduate with a doctor of ministry, a DM, and they're out there becoming the pastors of the next generation. What do you see in the preparation? that you contribute to that process and, and really a, maybe a, a regaining of that um, relationship between pastor and his people that I'm suggesting has uh, fallen on hard times. Well, the two, the two main ministerial degrees that we offer are the Master of Divinity and then the Doctor of Ministry. We offer other degrees as well, right. academic, PhD, and otherwise. But uh, in the MDiv, uh, it is possible to enter into that work directly out of college with not a lot of life experience, but with a, a, a solid educational work with a recommendation of a Christian community. And in that case, the uh, education often can easily fall into an academic context because you're learning, you've been a student, you continue to learn. The difference with a doctor of ministry is that someone is entering that after they've had years of experience, and they're no longer just academicians learning. They are now people who are hungering to equip themselves with the bumps and bruises, the blessings and burdens, and failures and successes of ministry. And they are far more serious learners because they are hungering to learn, and their experience makes them uh, able to see where their gifts and weaknesses are in a way. So a doctor of ministry degree is, is one where there is automatically experience and hunger. They're ready to learn both academically and practically in application. That's I'm not against either one. We need both. But I think one of the things I say to our young students entering into the MDiv, if they haven't had background, is make sure you surround yourself with people who've had experience, your elders or your deacons or whatever your form of government. And I often say every church needs to have uh, a, a doctor, a medical doctor, an accountant, a lawyer, and someone who's a successful businessman that will be part of the mentoring group of a young pastor, because he doesn't know what he doesn't know, and yet he will be asked to address issues that are very life-changing, and he will have biblical insight and some wisdom, but the uh, application will be limited, and those people that he can talk with honestly and say, I've got this issue. Can you give me guidance? It's very, very important. So, it's, But over time, a pastor who has grown and seasoned and, and taught the word becomes a counselor to those very kinds of people that will come to him and say, I'm a lawyer and I need help. I'm a doctor of medicine and I need help. I am an accountant. I'm facing this. So there's in re an interesting role reversal that takes place over time. But that's that's the nature of the church. It's growing and then becoming a mentor by learning and experience. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember several things as a young man, I, I was interested in mentors. I don't know if it was for the right reason or not, but found them hard to find. And then as I got older, there were some that functioned as mentors informally. Uh, and I was probably too stubborn to have learned as much as I should have from them and still made the mistakes that I wish my children wouldn't make and hope they won't. Uh, and of course, in the world that we are with education, we we seek to provide influence and wisdom enough to to avoid uh, youthful mistakes. And it, it is a tough balance. Uh, and it's the nature of life for the older generation to uh, um, speak into the younger generation in ways that they will listen uh, as a way of trying to see things build. Uh, and I think that the pastoral role plays a key role in it. And what you do in the training process sounds to me like you're you're thinking about these things and, and seeing them uh, come to fruition in good ways. Well, one of the things I would, would say is uh, those that are older should not overlook what a privilege it is for a young person to have them as a senior friend in their life. And we easily look at our own interests and say, I don't have time for that. But you know what? You're imparting life skills to a younger person that may really bless many, many people long after you've been called to eternity. Yeah. So we shouldn't overlook that. I do think uh, the pastoral role uh, is a, a place also where we ought to ask the question, do I have an incarnational component to my ministry? In other words, am I part of the lives of my people? Can they approach me? Can they be able to touch me with the feelings of their infirmities, just like we can with our high priest in heaven. And uh, that's that's hard, but we can create that opportunity through uh, opening ourselves to a, a group of people that we can mentor. So I was, another suggestion I've given to young pastors is start a community Bible study or join one and become not the guy who knows everything, but learning together with a group of guys where they're not all part of your denomination. They're part of different groups and their wild ideas. You engage and talk with them with respect. And, and those people help you to grow, to be more effective in your work. So I've, I have through the years been part of many men's Bible studies and I'm not always the teacher. I'm just one of the guys. And it's a wonderful way to become a mentor and to be mentored. And I think That's it's a really lot of wisdom good. in that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I want to, uh, there is a lot we could talk about there, but I want to talk about another area that I know that has interested you, you've written on, and that has to do uh, in the broadest terms with government. You wrote a book about George Washington called George Washington's Secret Fire. And what I want to get at is staying in the same theme of leadership and and where we see ourselves today and what we can do to inspire better leadership. Um, it might be uh, said that uh, the church has had a, a dearth of leadership, but I think it's even more true when we look at the civil magistrate and in Washington, D.C. in particular. We've had uh, some very concerning things going on in recent years. But tell me first, what were you trying to accomplish? The, the book's title implies something that may not be as um, uh uh, is easily understood without a little bit of explanation. What was George Washington's secret fire? What was the book about? Okay. Well, basically, the word is sacred, not secret. Oh, I'm sorry. I wrote it as secret, but you're right. And I knew that. <laughs> yeah. So I just wanted to know because Thank I don't you. want it to, I yeah, don't want it to be secret. I want it to be <laughs> well <My bad>. known. <laughs> okay. But that's okay. So basically, the, the thesis of the book is to challenge the ubiquitous claim that George Washington was a deist. Uh, what a deist is, is someone who believes that, well, there maybe there's a first cause of the universe, some divine figure, but he has absolutely no relationship with humanity. He has not revealed himself. He's not accessible through prayer. There is no providence. There's no religion that really has access to him. Is He's just a philosophical first cause. And that's claimed by scholars, by popular pundits. It's uh, historians have claimed it. And uh, I won't go into all the reasons why I felt like I needed to write this book, but there, that's a 20-minute story in its own right. <laughs> but what I can tell you is that uh, 
if you take Washington on his own terms, in his historical context, and in his own words, and there are voluminous messages of Washington. There's something like uh, 37 volumes that were of his writings as a, a politician, a military man, a businessman, a family man. And it's filled with theology. It's filled with Christianity, with claims of his Christian faith. He was an active churchman. And to me, the the understanding a great leader such as he is, I mean, his legacy is not just the Washington Monument and Washington as our capital, but the character that he in, uh, uh, placed upon the formation of our nation, his critical role in only serving for two terms, a peaceful transition of power, the military being under the civilian branch of government. All those things are direct results of his character. And I said, if those came about and he was a Christian, then we ought to be able to understand how his Christian leadership principles shape those things that are so important for the American story. So my argument is that you cannot look at Washington on his own terms and turn him into a deist. It would be just as much as looking at Marlon Detweiler and saying he hated education of children. It's an exact <laughs> opposite of your character. That's true of Washington. You can't make him into a deist if you take his own writing seriously. He, uh, uh, as I understand it, in the process of writing that, you learned a good bit about his leadership, too. How, what did you learn about that in contrast to what you observe today? What can we learn from his leadership uh, as a Christian, but also as a government official? Well, there's several thoughts that come to mind. There's some practical ones. Number one, he said, the higher a person moves up the ladder of authority, and this is in the context of the military, but he would agree in government, the more important character becomes. Wow. Because as a person gets higher up, the secrets that they know, the ability to cause harm increases. And of course, you have the story of a man named Benedict Arnold, a military hero who was a general who moved all the way up and almost turned over West Point and had Washington captured. We use the name Benedict Arnold today as a synonym for a traitor. Mm -hmm. Washington, his argument is the higher you go up, the more important character is. It seems like character doesn't matter anymore. That is the principled ability to live what are the fundamental principles of life and of government and of faith. That's one thing he would be very concerned. What happened to character? Second principle, he would uh, argue, he believed very strongly in disciplined frugality. Interesting word. In other words, he didn't mind luxury, but it was not because you're being squandering your resources. It's because you've carefully saved, successfully earned, and you've spent your money well. And so he warned our country about indebtedness and wasting our resources. Well, that's one of the fewest things we talk about today. Let's yeah. just print more money. The danger of our government is there. He also believed that there was a principle, a phrase I learned from him, what he called the good of the great whole. What he meant is every decision is, that a leader has to make has to be determined not by sectional interest or personal advancement, okay. but what's best for the whole community that you're leading. And the decision you may make may be personally painful may be hard on the people that are most close to you, but is what's necessary for the entire community you're leading if you're going to succeed. So in other words, the idea of I'm leading not just what gets me and my people ahead, but what I'm leading as a whole community and how do I advance them? That's a phrase that comes up again and again. And then the last one is the four that jumped into my mind and you asked the question is that he said, that we need to imitate the divine author of our blessed religion. Without a Im imitation in him in, in terms of his charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, we can never hope to be a happy nation. In other words, there, Christ's love, Christ's humility, Christ's commitment to peace need to be part of our national character. In other words, we're banishing Christ from everything as a principle today. Washington said we ought to be following his character as we look at it in these areas. And lastly, in his farewell address, the fifth one that I guess I'll add, is he said, religion and morality are indispensable supports 
for our political prosperity. In other words, we need to have religious training because it helps to create moral people. And you can't have a successful Republican form of government unless there are people that are morally committed to following words on a piece of paper. He said a, a constitution are just a wall of words, a mound of parchment, and a power drunk politician aided and abetted by lazy people can easily leap over it and disregard it. Oh. That's words that he actually wrote with his own pen. I paraphrased them, but basically he's saying, you need to be able to look at it and say, I'm obliged to follow this. These are the rules of my country. These are my constitution. So there's five quick principles that uh, Washington would look at Washington, D.C. and he say, why did you name the city after me? And you've disregarded foundational principles that I have uh, lived by and called the country to follow. It's an amazing uh disconnect between the city and the person what uh, do you have well we don't have much time and this is a, a a bevy of books not just a single one uh what quick wisdom might you offer for how we might right the ship so to speak for where we find ourselves obviously uh one of my motivations is to see uh our students come into a Christian work, the pastorate being a key part of that, but also into government work. How might they think about this in order to become the kind of people and influence those around them so that more become the kind of people that we need as government leaders? Okay, I would I would start with some very basic principles. In the uh, Westminster Confession, we have articles on the family, the church, and the state. Those are called uh, by Abraham Kuyper, the famous Dutch theologian and pol politician, the spheres of sovereignty. The, the, uh, he calls them oh, yeah. each yeah. sovereign spheres of life. And so we need to begin to be re-educated into our inheritance. We've been educated out of our inheritance, and you're doing part of the work, which is the family is the building block of all society. And it is no small thing to be a father and a mother. What a high calling it is of loving our family and raising our children. And moms who find themselves raising kids should not say, well, what's wrong with me? They ought to say, I'm shaping the next generation. I am shaping the character of those that will lead my country and establish the next families. When it comes to the church, we need to recognize the church is the moral custodian of the great truths of Western civilization, the Ten Commandments, the character of Christ and the gospel. And we need educated and godly leaders there. And then we need to not complain about the state and say, well, it's just a bunch of power drunk people. There ought to be people that go in there and to say, I want to make a difference. Aren't you glad your mechanic doesn't say, I'm not going to work on your car. I might get my hands dirty. <laughs> well, you say, I'm going in to fix the brakes. Well, thank you. We need people that feel called to go into the system of our political crises, say it's going to be rough and tumble. It could be really difficult. I'm going to be torn apart, but I'm called to do this, and I'm going to use my character to make an impact. When we get family, church, and state cooperating together, we have a stable society that has the ability to really move forward. And so the question with understanding the legitimate callings of each of those is how we should educate our children. We need to say, you're called to be perhaps a mother and a father. Do it well. You may be called to be a pastor, an elder, or a deacon, or a deaconess. Learn to do it well. You may be called to be a political leader. It's a high and lofty calling. Be un understand your principles, understand your character, and then do it to the glory of God and know it's going to be tough work. When we get Christian leaders working in all of those areas, we will make an impact. And I think I'll finish with this. You don't have to be a majority to make a difference. Someone has said it only takes about three or four pounds of salt to preserve 100 pounds of meat. We're to be the salt and light of the earth. You don't have to have the sun to light the darkness. You just need a candle. Yeah. And so if we are faithful lights where we're at, if we are the salt of the earth, we will begin to make an impact that will change where we're at. And you know what? As our Puritan forefathers said, do not curse the darkness. Light a candle that can light a thousand more. And that's what education, that's what ministry does, that's what godly family training is. And there are no quick fixes, 
but there are generational impacts. Our God says, I will be the God of your children and of their children after them to a thousand generations of those that love me and keep my commandments. So we start right here, turning the ship around in our family, in our church, in our state, and we know God is going to touch the future with our faithfulness, and that's how we're going to change the course of our nation. No quick fix, no quick politician, no quick gimmick, no f- platform, but faithfulness now in each of those areas doing our part with a vision to touch the future, and we will make a huge difference. I couldn't agree more. That is wonderful. I, I don't need to offer any other comment other than just to say thank you. Okay, well, it's my privilege. That's awesome. So good to have you, Dr. Peter Lightheart, uh, President of Westminster Seminary. Thank you, Peter. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I'll, you said I could correct you. It's Lilback, not Lightheart. Oh, did I call you? <laughs> yeah, I, I I know a great theologian by yeah. the name of Lightheart, but I don't want anyone to be confused. No, there, so. I didn't. I, I can't believe I said it. So I, I made two major mistakes here. I told you we didn't edit things. Now I'm wishing we did. <laughs> you can edit them out if you want, but there yeah. you go. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peter Lilback. Okay. Uh, this has been great. Thank Thanks, you so much. Great to Those be with you. Have joined us for Veritas Vox, the voice okay. of classical Christian education. Hope to see you next time. Thank you. Bye bye.